Welcome to the next video about PLC discrete output devices. Fortunately, as you might expect, outputs and inputs behave very similarly, they're just opposites from each other. And that's true in the wiring examples as well. In fact, most output wiring for PLCs is even simpler than input wiring. So we'll look at some examples of those. But what are common output devices for these discrete outputs? Well, again, discrete means on and off only. So if you can think of a device that must be turned on and off by the PLC, it's probably a discrete device. Now a lot of times these push buttons, which buttons by themselves are an input, they'll have indicator lights or illuminated push buttons is often what they're called. And inside they have a light bulb and that light bulb is a separate device from the push button. It doesn't always mean that press the button and the light turns on. Often that's the case, but not always. We can control them separately. So the light is an output while the button contact is an input. Other examples of really common outputs are coil-based devices, which we'll look at a little bit of a warning for these coil devices in a minute. Uh, but coils are contactors, relays, or solenoid valves, which allow the flow of either electricity or a fluid system uh, to, to allow that to work. But uh, one thing that we have to know about these outputs is that we're limited in the amount of current that we can send through them. So that means that the final load device, which usually is some sort of motion, uh, a motor, a pump for fluid, things like that, that actually drives the motion. Those motors and pumps will not be driven directly by a PLC. The PLC will drive a control device, like a contactor or a solenoid, that allows the motion to take place, thereby allowing the PLC to operate with a much smaller voltage and current, less power dissipation, but the final system, the motion that needs to occur, can actually take place. There's just going to be some sort of in-between, an intermediary device, and that's what the PLC logic will be responsible for driving. So let's take a look at those examples of wiring and some very simple ladder logic to control those output devices for our Allen Bradley, Siemens, and Automation Direct PLCs as various examples, and let's see how that works. Here you can see that I have fastened the solenoid coil to the rail. That just makes it easier for us to be able to watch the connections without having to hold it in front of the PLC. But I have the two connections which require 24 volts and the negative supply. Now if you remember back to our digital inputs, this built-in integrated terminal I.O. strip allows us to make a connection both with the output terminal and with the common connection which returns back to the negative of our field power supply. This makes the connection really easy. Now before I test it, let me press the button, and I just left the button connected to terminal zero, but the ladder logic program commands output terminal zero to activate when the button is energized. That means that once I've got the output connected, I should easily be able to see that in a demonstration. So I'll first connect the comm to one of the terminals, which has a C, which connects again to the negative of the power supply and to power. This is terminal zero. So what I should see now is when I press the button, the coil indicated by an LED should activate and I should hear a click. And sure enough, it's working exactly as it should. Let's take a look at how we design these programs, although they're very simple at this point, in the three different pieces of software that allow us to program an Allen Bradley, Siemens, and Automation Direct PLC. In this first example, let's take a look at the Allen Bradley Logix Designer setup that'll allow us to program a single input to turn on or energize a single output. Now the way these addresses work is that the first address, local1idata0, refers to the built-in integrated input or it might refer to the first slot in a module setup and the first card in the first terminal, which is the data.0 of that card. Now as you can see in this line, we have it set up as looking for electricity to be energized through that circuit and when that happens, the electricity in the output also energizes in local 1O for output data 0, terminal 0. So input terminal 1 will activate output terminal 1, labeled as terminal 0, but they are the first one in line. To demonstrate this test on the Siemens PLC, we have one extra wiring connection that we need to make. Remember in the Allen Bradley, the internal connection to the field connector, the field power supply, allowed both the inputs and the outputs to be either supplied with power or connected to ground. 
But in the Siemens PLC, the common connection, which is labeled 1L, requires a voltage supply from wherever our DC power supply is, which in this case, we've broken out the built-in DC power supply over to here. So I'm going to need to run one extra wire initially from the 24 volt power supply that's built in, and I'm going to have to supply that to the first terminal, which is our common connector, common for every PLC, sometimes built in if we're lucky, like in the Allen Bradley PLC, but regardless, we still have to worry about making sure that we've supplied power to the load device. Remember that the power supply to the PLC itself does not power our load devices. It's only completing a separate circuit. Now that we've done that, we should be able to connect our negative supply connection for the load device. And the final connection is to the first output terminal. And we've programmed this PLC to activate the first output terminal when the first input terminal is connected. And once I've made that connection, when I press the button, I can see that the light lights up on the solenoid indicating that I have a momentary output of this solenoid. So our consistency between these PLCs is that we must supply the common output bank with power, and then the program determines when each of the terminals receives that power, and all we have to do is make sure that the load continues the circuit back to the negative of the power supply. In the totally integrated automation portal, which allows us to program the Siemens S7 1200 series of PLCs, this is the basic version. It's an older version, version 13. But as you can see, we have many of the same applications, although the software looks different. But in this line of logic, we have I 0.0, which is the first address, the first input terminal, just like on the Allen Bradley PLC. We also have Q, which is the label for outputs on a Siemens PLC, instead of O, which looks a lot like zero, and those can be confused, Q is the indicator for an output. So Q 0.0, .0 is for the first of our output terminals. And as you can see in this line of logic, our first input terminal activates the first output terminal, performing the exact same function that it did in the Allen Bradley PLC. For our final example, with the Automation Direct Productivity 1000, we see a very similar setup to the Siemens PLC, where the common connection terminal does not have anything connected to it right now. That means that even if we activated the output, we wouldn't see any voltage going off to our load. So the first connection that must be made is from the common terminal of the outputs to the power supply so that we get the power to the module to transfer it to the load. So let's make that connection really quickly. Connection to the module and connection to power. Now I can go about making the connections to the load. So first I will use the first of the outputs, output term, the first output terminal, which in Automation Direct is terminal one, not zero like it is in most languages. And then I can use the common return path to simply go back to the common return for my DC power supply. Now when I press the button, I can see that my output energizes and the red light on the load is on. This counts for any sort of DC powered load. It's not just for these solenoid coils, whether that's an indicator light, whether that's a relay coil, you're gonna have a positive and negative outgoing wires going to that load. So you can make those wiring connections in exactly the same fashion as you see here with virtually any load device that requires two wires, which is a huge majority of them. And finally, for our Automation Direct Productivity Series PLC, the numbering is similar, again, using ones and zeros, but in this case, we have DI for discrete input and followed by a 1111. Now remember, in Automation Direct, this one is a little bit unique from the ones that I've seen. It may not be the only one out there, but in my experience, most PLCs, the first terminal is zero. The first slot is zero. In computer numbers, the first number typically is zero. But in this case, the first terminal of the first module is given the address 1.1. Now in our output, since this is a combination module, it's still output 1.1. So the first input terminal activates the first output terminal. And as you can see, even though we've barely even started to look at the software at all, you can see a very distinct similarity between the way that these look in three completely different brands of PLCs. And we'll keep coming back to that concept quite a bit as we go through.
Most PLC output devices are inductive, which means that they're an inductor, a coil of wire that uses an electromagnetic force to activate a mechanical switch inside. Here's a couple of examples of those that are really common. First of all, relays. Now we understand that PLCs were originally designed to replace relay logic control systems, but that doesn't mean that relays are gone. It simply means that they'll be used to activate maybe perhaps large voltages or currents that would be dangerous to pass through the PLC. Different voltages is a really common use. If the PLC runs on 24 volts, but you need to run a 110 volt application, PLCs, you, driving relays is still a very common application. A slightly larger version of a relay is what they call a contactor, which is still a coil. It has contacts inside, which give it the name contactor. But most often, these will be paired with a motor overload relay, which form a motor starter system. Very common for driving three-phase motors if a variable frequency drive is just a little bit too advanced, if it just needs to be turned on and off on a periodic basis. Uh, and finally, another really common output type of device is the solenoid valve used for controlling hydro or pneumatic air systems. This is a really small example of a pneumatic drive system, but some of the larger hydraulic solenoids, those things can be huge and they consume a lot of electricity. Now, if they run on 24 volts, the only way to get a lot of electricity is to send a lot of current. So there's a danger here that we have to be aware of in outputs that we didn't see on the input side. And it is, if we are driving a coil-based inductive device, it takes a second for us to build up the magnetic field inside of it. But once we've done that and then turn it off, like when any PLC output de-energizes, a large amount of voltage is sent back into the device that was supplying it. In other words, it drives a high voltage back into the PLC. This is sometimes called flyback voltage. There's a few different names for it, but uh, there's devices called diodes, which are usually a discrete semiconductor device, but they can be placed in parallel with a coil terminal, and it's put in reverse bias, which doesn't allow current to bypass the coil, but what it does is allow current, when that reverse voltage is sent, the current harmlessly travels around the coil, forming its own small loop, instead of driving that voltage and a current, potentially a spark, back into the module that was driving it. This is a common culprit for relays and relay modules in PLCs being a physical switch to fail when a large coil device is energized and de-energized frequently, a spark is generated periodically inside the module and it'll eventually burn up. So in case you haven't been able to tell, I love consistency. I love consistency between different makes, different models of PLCs, and the fact that they run on electricity means that we can always understand why we need to make the connections the way we do. They may seem a little bit mysterious in how and when we're supposed to connect wires, but it always comes back to the basic rules of electricity, making every PLC honestly really easy to understand. We just have to understand why it is that we're trying to complete the circuits the way they are. So this covers the inputs and outputs for the discrete on and off signals. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the analog signals. We're also going to have a chance to explore some of the more uh, advanced programming techniques that are used, including timers, counters, some basic math instructions to get an idea of what the computer processor inside is capable of. So Stay tuned and check out more.